So, good morning in Focus Church. It's good to be with you here today. It's also good to be with those of you who are with us online today as well. Uh, speaking of joining us online, I would like to just share some encouraging news uh, from those that are watching online, because obviously we're in a, a, a new uh, time, if you will, particularly as it relates to online and people watching live right now in both of our services, we do this and streaming. And it's not just people that go to church here and can't get here or on vacation. It's, it's people really everywhere. And so I, I'd like to encourage you today, just because it's really uh, amazing what God is doing for those that are watching and engaging with us at In Focus Online. There was a lady in Louisiana that lives right outside of New Orleans, who's been watching our services since March of this year. She has particularly been encouraged, uh, she said, about the messages on justice and unity since she lives in probably one of the most divided areas in our nation. Her daughter goes to church here, and she texted her daughter after last week's message and said this, I wish the whole world could have been listening to this message this morning. Now, I don't say that because that's really, and if you're watching, that's way too kind. Uh, but most of all, I share that because I am glad that God is using the messages from our church to encourage people in a time that we need to be encouraged in what God is doing in us, the church, in the earth today. And so that is, yeah, we can applaud that. That's super exciting. Hello, Louisiana. Uh, that's great. Also, I want to mention that as we, uh, if you missed last week, I would encourage you to watch that as we, actually the title of the message was Left or Right. We're talking about drawing lines in the sand. I can't really think of a better message to listen to and uh, go back and ruminate on, meditate on in light of what's taken place even this week as we reminded us that the kingdom of God is the kingdom that we serve the most and, and that as those who are a part of the kingdom of God, we are to be doing the work of the kingdom. And whether it's the mission team that we just mentioned, I love the fact that Serve Week landed this week. We didn't really plan it that way, but it did. What better thing to be doing in our community than in the, and in the earth except doing what Jesus taught us to do, which is to not be served but to serve, to focus on living the way Christ has called us to live. I love that. As a matter of fact, even today, November 8th, is Orphan Sunday, and this is a day where we remember that the kingdom of God is needed to do not what we're asking the government to do, but what the church has been implored, encouraged, and mandated to do. Did you know that as we talk about a lot of political things, that there are still some 443,000 orphans in the U.S. alone, 123,000 of them ready to be adopted today. Did you know that as we worry about things that are going on in our own nation, and that's, first of all, we shouldn't be worried, but as we worry about those things, did you know that in the world there are now 140 million orphans? some 15 million of them that have lost both their parents. And I think about the kingdom of God and those that are a part of his kingdom and what God has called us to do. Does that mean that everybody has to foster? Does that mean that everybody has to adopt? I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is on a day like today, we remember that if the kingdom of God doesn't do what the kingdom of God is supposed to do, then there is no hope. Whatever that means for you and your family, for us in this church, we have, we bought into the fact that we're called to take care of the widow and the orphan. We bought into the reality that we're to be a part of fostering and adopting and doing whatever we can to support those that do that. And we believe on a day like today, we should remember that this is why the kingdom of God is necessary. Now, as many of you know, this past week was a really, really big week as it marked the beginning of No Shave November. <laughs> what did you think I was going to say? <laughs> oh, the election. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, that as well. Uh, well, all I can say is that this election cycle was the most, and still is, the most 2020 election cycle that there could be. 
I mean, I literally, when I did the video and, and recorded the video to send out this week, I said, the election should be over by now, but because it's 2020, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not. And there are some that still believe that it's not, some that believe that it is, some that are celebrating like the Savior just entered the White House, and some that are crying like the Savior just left the White House. And I'll remind you of what I said last week when Joshua asked, are you for us or our enemy? No. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Lord. Savior's not going in. Savior's not going out. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you don't believe that, then you don't trust the Lord who's Lord over all. So, yes, this took place, a big thing this week. And last week, as I mentioned in the first message in our series, Lines in the Sand, politics is just one of the seemingly limitless issues that we take sides on in the earth. We're inherently bent towards tribalism. We're inherently bent towards human beings taking sides and getting ugly really fast. But the worst kind of tribalism that we're talking about in this series is Christian tribalism, where we draw lines in the sand about particular issues or preferences. We take sides, we build camps, then we have our tribes, and the rhetoric of us and them and we and they ensues. While at the same time we self-righteously see nothing wrong with anything on the side that we're on and that we've drawn. The reason this is the worst kind of tribalism is because as Christians, we're meant to be one, loving, unified, a coalition of compassionate people reflecting the heart of God to a divided and fearful and hurting world. But it's hard to shine when your light is burned out. It's hard to light up the darkness when a broken light is all we've got. And I see a lot of brokenness right now. I've watched as Christians have trolled other Christians and publicly demeaned them online, demonized, belittled, scoffed, mocked, made fun of, insulted, not their enemies, but their brothers and sisters in Christ. To that point, Luke 6, Jesus said, you heard it in the intro video, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who mistreat you. If that's how he tells us to treat our enemies, then just logically we can infer how we're to treat our spiritual family, no matter what side of a line they may be on. When we fail to love one another as Christ loves us, us, when we fail to love our brother and sister in Christ as Christ loves us, God says we don't love him. He says we're liars. First John lets us understand this. We become what we may have accused others of being, but never want to admit that we are ourselves, and that is a hypocrite. Hypocrisy means to pretend. Hypocrisy idiomatically means to have two faces, two tongues, two hearts. Hypocrisy may be the reason somebody like Gandhi said this about Christianity. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So which is it today as we draw a line in the sand? And let's talk about this is what we're going to talk about. Are you a hypocrite or are you a work in progress? And I believe that all of us will default to being a work in progress because we're the most lenient on ourselves, aren't we? We want justice for everybody else. We want grace for ourselves. So if I'm going to lean towards one or the other, if I've got to be a hypocrite or a work in progress, well then, bless God, pastor, I'm a work in progress. The line that is often drawn here is that hypocrisy and spiritual growth, work in progress, sanctification, are mutually exclusive. You're either a hypocrite or you're a verifiable work in progress. But history and the Bible tell us that they actually do go together. It's actually true that you can be both. For the kingdom of God, many times it's both and. A lot of times it's both and. Now and not yet. Victory, yes, but I'm still walking through a world of a lot of defeat. Romans 3.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, right? It says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. 
Romans 7, 15, the apostle Paul has that big conundrum, right? Why is it that I do what I don't want to do and what I don't want to do is what I do and I hate that? This is what he says. He's, what is he doing? He's describing the frustration of us as believers in this spiritual failure that we'll go through sometimes. The two conditions Paul describes here exist in tension. There's a cyclical advance going on, or at least there should be as we grow in Christ. The two conditions Paul described exist simultaneously, and it's the recognition of our inability to live up to our deepest spiritual longing. God, I'm doing things that I don't want to do, and I hate it. That's a, a, a deep spiritual longing that we have. We've all been there. That's Romans chapter 7. And then it leads us to cast all of our cares upon God's spirit for power and victory. That's why chapter 8 of Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's the victory. It's the tension of the failure. I'm doing these things I don't want to do. And the victory, but God is able. And there's no condemnation. And failure to continue in reliance upon the power of the Holy Spirit places us once again in a position of inviting defeat into our lives and joining with Paul in what he says in Romans 7. Here I go again. Sanctification, work in progress, if you want to call it that, is a gradual process that repeatedly takes the believer through this recurring sequence of failure through self-dependency to triumph through the indwelling empowerment of the Holy Spirit to have victory over sin. So it's both and. So if they, hypocrisy and work in progress, sanctification, spiritual maturity, however, you, there's a lot of synonyms there. If they're not mutually exclusive, then there must be a tension that we have to embrace where it's both and, but not in a I am what I am, so get over it kind of way, and more in a way that is, God, I don't want to do this. I want to live for you. I want to change. I want to grow. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be a sweet aroma in the earth. That's what I want. I want people to see my life. I want people to, to see me in such a way that they see Christ. 2 Corinthians actually says this, right? 2.15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. The college years for me was an era of cologne and perfume aromas. At least that's how I remember it. I don't know if that was like the era of cologne and perfume in the late 80s, early 90s. Maybe it's just as popular today. I have no idea. But it seemed like that's all we talked about and all we thought about. And I don't know, like Dracar and like Dracar. Polo, Eternity, Obsession, Poison, Lauren. These were just the popular ones then. Some of you may still wear them. I don't know. I remember I had a teacher in college, and she used to wear so much perfume. I believe it was actually poison. Not, not poison, killing me poison, but just that's the name of the brand. And you knew that she was in her studio that day because we would walk in, and, and she, we'd go from the first floor to the second floor because you would hit the stairwell, and this is like minutes, maybe even hours after she had been through, but you knew because the aroma of her perfume was still in the stairwell. Well, she's here, she's in class today. We got class because I, I smell that aroma. And here's what I want to ask. What aroma lingers from your life after you've been somewhere? What do people smell when you've been around? What is it that they get a taste of in their mouth or their nostrils? Now, I know I've been around a long time and I've been called a hypocrite in my lifetime. You probably have too. And the truth of the matter is it's very simple. And let me just go ahead and, and share it with you today because this is the truth. Christians are hypocrites. It reminds me of a joke about a guy that says to his friend, I don't want to go to your church. There's just a bunch of hypocrites there. His reply was, well, great, what's one more? See, if you're like me, and I gave my life to Jesus when I was 10 years old, so I've grown in a lot of ways over the last whew, 40 years. Man, that sounds old. But here's what I do know. I, I have grown. 
I've grown in, in compassion towards people. I've, I've grown in the way that I view people that are different than me. I've grown in the way that I see or at least try to see the image of God in others before uh, my prejudices and my biases and my judgments begin to kick in. I've grown in trusting God more than my own strength. I've grown in resting in his hands in situations that I can't control. Uh, I've also grown in, in ways of giving him some of my burdens instead of trying to carry them myself. But if I'm honest with myself, just as if you're honest with yourself, there are other ways and areas of my life that I'm like, why haven't I grown more? Why do I still keep doing this? Like Paul in Romans 7, why is it that I do this thing that I hate that I do? Because there are times, if I'm honest, that my old self creeps back in and it's, things are too much for me and I struggle with things that I know I shouldn't struggle with. I, I get anxious. I'll get depressed about things that I can't change. I, I'll, I'll still get impatient and react to my wife or my kids. I can get very despondent. I can be fearful at times. And I just wonder in those moments when I'm going through this, and here we are again, God, I think in my mind, why would you even use me? But if I look at the Bible, I'm encouraged because it's full of humanity grappling with hypocrisy. Moses, doubting God. Abraham, Isaac, having their own issues, so much so that they made some really, really dumb decisions. Jacob, was a liar, two-faced. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Solomon was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. And then there's all kinds of kings and all of the issues that they dealt with that takes us into the New Testament. And Thomas was a doubter. And Peter was impulsive. And, and Paul, yeah, well, what was he? he? He was the guy that I mentioned a moment ago that was struggling, doing the things that he wished that he wouldn't do and not doing the things that he really wanted to do to please God. And here's what I know. This is not an excuse to keep on living a lie of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Instead, it should encourage us this morning that God holds tighter to us than we hold to him. That God is faithful to you and to me even when we're faithless. It is his grace that saves us. It is his grace that empowers us to live more and more righteously. If there is hope for all of these elitist, murderers, racists, adulterers, then there is hope for you and me and everybody else that would call on the name of the Lord. There's hope. See, our correct response when it comes to those moments that we realize that we're two-faced, two-tongued, hard-hearted is to admit our hypocrisy and let it be brought into the light of Jesus Christ. We do what one of my favorite verses says to do and should be the favorite scripture of every growing hypocrite in here. 1 John 1, 19, if we confess with our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now listen, uh, the reason I put that in parentheses there, because I don't know if you've ever struggled with this. I know I have, that I've read that. So the prayer of a righteous person. I'm like, well, I'm not righteous, so what good is this going to do? Here's what a righteous person is. Because you're not righteous in your own ability to do what's right. You're not made righteous by you somehow making yourself righteous. A righteous person is a person whose sins have been confessed, as it says in 1 John, and have been forgiven because that's what Jesus does. He forgives us of our sins. And then whose righteousness? He clothes us in his righteousness. We're clothed in his righteousness. And then it says, I love this, working. That word working means presently working. It's effective right now, today, in this moment. I'm going from hypocrisy to holy right now, each and every day. It is right now working. How? As we confess our sins to God, Jesus forgives us presently, and now that power is at work right now, today, in my life. And, and here's the truth. God is working in Christians, and he's been doing that for centuries 
The world has been changed by the, what has happened in the life of Christians throughout this world. Don't believe the fake news that the world would be better off if all these hypocrites would disappear. That's not true. The Christian caricatures of, of us in culture and in movies, don't believe that false narrative because we are having an impact in the world and always have. In this sanctifying battle with our own hypocrisy, listen to me, no other religion, ideology, or philosophy has inspired and embodied self-sacrifice, generosity, and love more than those that are living out their lives of faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing. Though imperfect, Christians throughout the world and throughout history have made the world better, not worse. Whether healthcare, education, science, math, art, music, many Christians have reflected the beauty and the creativity of God well. Even when we do mess up, most of us are grieved by the Holy Spirit. And like Paul, we don't want to do it again. Our hope is to grow and to change, and that should be the longing of our hearts, the fruit of our lips, and the proof of our actions. The reason I say that is because we can't just say, well, I just don't, I don't I, yeah, yeah, I don't want to do that again. Well, what are you going to do to empower, be empowered so that you don't? That's why it has to be something not just that we say, but something that we prove with our actions. And the key to living as an HBS, what is an HBS, you might ask? A hypocrite being sanctified. That's what we are. Is to be honest with one another, that's where we confess our sins with one another, and to be honest with God, that's where we're confessing to him, and we own the area of our lives where we're falling short. We express our grief and even our frustration honestly because there's something very attractive about that to others as opposed to self-righteous, prideful, arrogant finger-pointing that we often get into. It's like this letter that I got. Thank you for your self-righteous finger pointing and angry indignation towards me. I have decided to give my life to Jesus because of it. Said no one ever. <laughs> I didn't really get that letter because nobody ever would say that. Humbled hypocrites being sanctified works in progress. And it's a process of inviting other hurting people to join the spiritual family of those who are not perfect but are growing in Christ. Now listen, as I mentioned briefly a moment ago, I'm not up here giving some sort of backhanded excuse for us to live as unrepentant hypocrites. Don't Well, Pastor Brent just said we were works in progress. Let's go do what we want to do. That's not what I'm saying. Because of the grace of God, grace upon grace, as John 1.16 says, we have power over sin right now. Presently, it is at work in us as we confess to God and to one another. That's the prayer of a righteous person that is availing much so that we can be enabled by the Holy Spirit to be less and less hypocritical and more and more holy. 1 Corinthians 10, as encouragement, says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. What is idolatry? Placing anything above God in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, and in our hope. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he goes on to say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. So yes, we are still at times hypocrites. But because of Jesus living in us and working through us, this is not some hopeless, endless cycle of sin and hypocrisy that I've got to be stuck in. Jesus did not just come to save us, but he came to sanctify us in the truth. He came to make us as a work in progress to be more like Christ. Christ. He came to make us to be able through his grace to go from hypocrites to those who are walking in holiness. That's why John 17 says they are not of the world. Jesus is praying to the Father, just as I am not of the world, sanctify them in the truth. What is the truth? Your word is truth. As you see, sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 
And as we apply the word of God, that's the truth, to our lives, Jesus transforms our lives. And over time, into his own likeness, we begin to become more and more and more. I'm a little bit more like Jesus today than I was yesterday, I hope, by God's grace and my honesty with God and with one another. We admit that our own strength isn't sufficient. We admit that our plans often do not work. We admit that our self-help strategies are going to fall woefully short. And that we do, as I have found in my own life, we get close to Jesus. And the closer I get to Jesus, the more I see that I'm really nothing like him. The closer I get to him, the more I see there's things in me that do not respond like Jesus does. I wrote a song years ago, and that was really the whole, I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. It's the whole theme of it. It's the closer I get to you, the more I see I'm nothing like you. And here I am, I don't know, some 20 plus years later, and I could still sing it the same way. So how do we, as I draw this to a close, how do we, who are being transformed, how do we begin to do it in such a way that we're the fragrance of Christ in the earth where people begin to notice Jesus more than they notice us? Despite some areas of hypocrisy, which we will all have in this life, that's why I'm saying we're going to do something hypocritical. Count on it. How do we, in the midst of that, become the Christians that cause people to want to know more about Jesus instead of wanting to punch us in the face and have nothing to do with Jesus? Very simply, it is the beauty of the Lord. That we would declare the beauty of the Lord. That we would spend time in the presence of Jesus, gazing at the beauty of the sun, S-O-N, that we begin to reflect more and more that sun. And there are so many scriptures that describe the beauty of the Lord that we're supposed to look like, who we're supposed to look like in Christ, which is beautiful, like the well-known fruit of the Spirit passage in Galatians 5, which says this is what you should look like. And guess who it was written to? It was written to elitist Christian hypocrites in Galatia. And he said this, but the the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the fruit of living by the Spirit and not living for our flesh. So as transformed hypocrites continually being transformed, we become like Jesus by belonging to Jesus, being sanctified and justified by Jesus, by Jesus by being with Jesus. Now, I know that's a long sentence, so I'm going to put it another way as well. Your proximity with the person of Christ, see, our proximity with the person of Christ changes me into the person I'm supposed to be in Christ. Could it be that our approach to being more like Jesus from transforming from hypocrisy to holiness has been a little bit off? Instead of focusing on trying to be like Jesus, we need to spend more time with Jesus. Because the closer you get to him, the more you'll see you're nothing like him, but the more you'll be transformed into becoming like him. It is impossible to be like Jesus without spending time with Jesus. It's impossible to know Jesus without spending time knowing Jesus. See, the more we worship him wholeheartedly, the more we stay with him longer than a hurried two minutes in the morning, the more we meditate on his word, the more we declare the beauty of the Lord, the more we live in community with the people of God, the more we remember correctly what Christ has done through sacraments like communion and other ways, the more we trust, the more we obey, the more we follow in Jesus' footsteps and fulfill his mission for us, the more we smell like a pleasing aroma to those who come around us, who follow in our path, or who walked through the stairwell hours after we did. It's not in desiring and trying to produce more fruit that we do. I want more fruit. I want more fruit. I want You're going to hurt yourself doing that. It's actually making sure that we stay connected to the vine, which is Jesus, that produces more fruit. See, the fruit grows as a byproduct of being in the presence of worshiping in awe of, losing track of time with our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus is the producer of the fruit of the Spirit. And we can either be cut off as dead branches or we can be pruned as fruitful ones that are going to be more fruitful. Either way, we get cut. 
Either way, it's painful. But the end result of one is so much better than the other. So if someone says to you, you're a hypocrite, you're not acting much like Jesus, you proclaim to love and serve, well then own it. Confess it. We are being transformed. We're working out our salvation. We're growing in our Christ likeness. And by God's grace, we're becoming more and more holy and less and less hypocritical. We have all the help we need in Christ alone and his amazing grace and the power of his Holy Spirit. And maybe more people will see the lines erased that divide us and keep others from Jesus and they'll join us in our authentic, hypocritical lives, if you will, who are being transformed daily by the power of his name. It's a both and with Jesus. And let me say this. And one last example, no matter, because I don't want to give any excuses here, because our relationship with Christ, that's all we're going to have to, to speak of is how we related to him when it comes to that day when we stand before God in Christ in heaven in judgment. So no matter how hypocritical your life may be, everybody has to come to Christ on their own. You cannot ignore Jesus because some of his followers don't act like him. And if you're watching or you're here this morning, you say, well, that's the reason I haven't really committed to this. Listen to me. We come to Jesus based on Jesus' own merits, not on the faults of his followers. Now, for his followers, we shouldn't be stumbling blocks either. I'd like to close with a fairly well-known story about Jesus found in John 8, 2 through 11. I thought about lines in the sand and I knew I wanted to say this at some point in time. This story is one where Jesus uh, is in the temple courts and the religious people, the, we could just, the churchgoers, if you will, of that day found a woman caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus in the temple courts and threw her at his feet and basically said, the law requires that we stone her, that we kill her. And so what are you going to do? Now forget all the, for a moment, the self-righteousness of the accusers and the apparent injustice of the adulterous man's absence. And I want you to hear what Jesus said to this woman, because her guilt was real. She committed the crime of adultery. That was real. And God, through Moses, commanded her death because of it. But the Son of God said, in essence, and let's just say he got down and he decided just to draw a line in the sand. And there's the, the self-righteous hypocrites on this side. And there's the woman who is guilty of sin on this side. And it's like Jesus stepped over to this side and said, he is without sin, cast the first stone. Go ahead, you can do that, but it's going to have to hit me as well. They all left. Jesus said, where are your accusers? They're gone. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Why? Because if we think about this, God fully intended for the sin of adultery to be punished to the full extent of the law. But guess who was not going to bear that punishment? The woman that Jesus stood with. She would go free. Instead, Jesus would be punished in her place. Maybe Jesus wrote Isaiah 53 down there and he said when he was writing something in the sand. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All are like sheep and have gone astray. We've turned every one of us to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every one of us, in a sense, is that woman. Every one of us, in that sense, had that hypocrisy in our own lives. Sins, whatever they may be, shameful lust, destructive tongues, murderous hearts, covetous pride, greed. And it stands exposed before God as plainly as this woman did in the temple courts that day. Our condemnation is deserved. But aren't you glad that we don't get what we deserve? That mercy triumphs over justice. That in this moment, mercy came in the place and in the face of Jesus Christ. 
and he says these stunning words, neither do I condemn you. Why? Because he has been condemned in your place. All your guilt has been removed. No stone of God's righteous wrath is going to crush you because Jesus was crushed for your iniquities. And now the victory that Romans 8 talks about comes back in and cycles back in for all of us hypocrites being sanctified. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus was the only one in that crowd that day who could have in perfect righteousness require the woman's death. He was the only one in that crowd that day who in perfect righteousness could pardon her sin. And mercy triumphed over judgment at the great cost to Jesus' life. And the same is true for us today. To further that point, we've all also been the self-righteous hypocrites trying to cast stones at others instead of looking for ways to help them or save them in order to make ourselves feel better. We've all been on the side of trying to pull out the speck in another person's eye while not admitting there's a big log sticking out of ours. But the opportunity is there for us on this side of the line as well. So here's the reality. If you think about this line, and Jesus is over here, and he's saying, hey, without, without me, we're all going to die. So whoever has it, doesn't have any sin, just go ahead and start throwing. And here's the choice on this side for all of us self-righteous hypocrites, me included at times, right? I can forgive as I've been forgiven. I can love as I've been loved. I can help as I've been helped, extend grace and mercy as I've been extended grace and mercy. Or I can walk by, drop my stone, slut, whore. See, the only way that Jesus gets to erase the line is if we stay and admit our hypocrisy. And on that day, Jesus could have bent down and erased every dividing line between the sinful and the hypocrite, the religious and the unrighteous. And they all could have stood there together and been forgiven. See, my hope today is that we'll find ourselves on Jesus' side. It's good when Jesus comes and draws in the sand because he puts all who are willing on his side and erases all the lines that once divided us from him and from one another. Amen? Let's pray.